Uh, so thanks everyone. Um, I'm Catherine McKenzie uh, and, and uh, so nice to have spent the past couple of days hearing from you all. Um, I'm honored to be joining you all today from the unceded territories of the Wissanic peoples, uh, where I am with my family, but I want to acknowledge and um, and speak with gratitude that I actually live, learn, work, um, and play on unceded Musqueam, Slavotwick, and Squamish territories, uh, which is where I undertook the bulk of my practicum work. Um, I'm an uninvited settler on these lands of Scottish, Ukrainian, and Welsh ancestry, and I'm here with deep gratitude and humility for my hosts on these beautiful lands. My presentation today describes some key process findings from a practicum placement with BC's Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions, where I managed the development of a new knowledge product for cross-jurisdictional health policy on wise practices for developing and delivering culturally safe treatment and recovery services for Indigenous people who use substances. Uh, this presentation focuses on the development process rather than the actual final product, though I am, of course, happy to speak to that if folks have questions, uh, but just wanted to recognize that as we are navigating increasingly intersectoral and complex health challenges, there is a great need to consider how we actually operationalize the public health policy cycle. So to start, I want to clarify what I mean when I'm talking about wise practices. Some of you might already be quite familiar with this term, but it's likely that you might have more commonly heard the term best practices. Uh, wise practices describe local and culturally specific learnings rather than looking for those universal best practices that seek to work for everyone and in every context. Uh, in this work, we were really focusing on identifying wise practices that uphold distinctions-based approaches to cultural safety, recognizing that practices that work best to support one community might share characteristics while also being specific to a particular cultural and experiential context. Uh, so for over half the past decade, jurisdictions across Canada have been grappling with increasing toxicity uh, attributed to the drug supply. Um, and I think some other presentations have done a very good job in speaking to this, so I won't spend too long on that. But the, the cumulative effect has been a forced reckoning on the gaps and barriers in existing substance use systems of care. Uh, in particular, we've seen that the gaps between populations that are experiencing disproportionate rates of harm alongside minimal access to appropriate supports have been made quite clear. Uh, my practicum project was developed and situated within the larger work of a cross Canada FPT working group that had representatives from health ministries and research bodies across different provincial and territorial jurisdictions. This group was tasked with uh, addressing key informational needs for effective health policy planning uh, and specifically looked at uh, substance use treatment and recovery systems. So in my practicum, I managed a project team that had representatives from Health Canada and our provincial ministry, MMHA, with a cross-jurisdictional oversight and governance structure. Uh, because I was a part-time student, this work spanned eight months, and I'm happy to report that as of early April, we have in fact launched a prototype knowledge product uh, that was responsive to the, the working group's agenda. So in this project, we had four key goals that were defined by both our project team and our partners, so it was highly collaborative. Uh, first, we needed to provide a fulsome overview of the current state of treatment and recovery services for each jurisdiction in Canada, including identifying where there were both challenges and opportunities. Uh, next, we had to map out who our key collaborators and partners would, uh, would be with, to meaningfully get the information and input required to achieve our goal output, in this case, the knowledge product. Uh, our small but very mighty team relied heavily on our partners for their respective expertise and wisdom. Uh, and then, of course, the next two goals are probably fairly self-evident given the topic of my presentation, but we had to identify those wise practices and then uh, consolidate them into a final knowledge product, a, a virtual knowledge product, uh, as it were. So the fifth and less explicit goal um, was to model with our process the principles we were highlighting in the actual outcome and output. And in this particular project, those principles were cultural safety and humility, trauma-informed and trauma-specific practices, centering the voices, evidence, and wisdom of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and urban Indigenous people with lived and living expertise of substance use, and being iterative and collaborative and cooperative at each stage of the work. So in this work, it was clear that how we did the work was just as important as what we ended up doing with the work. So as with any project, of course, we did have some notable challenges and I wanted to highlight a few of them here as I think they are representative of some larger struggles that folks might be experiencing when seeking to do collaborative public health policy. 
So the first and arguably most profound challenge was that by virtue of how this project was situated in that FPT working group and the people that are typically invited to participate on these tables, there was an underrepresentation of Indigenous folks uh, in our governance structure. And this is a challenge that, a, that is pretty endemic across government and health systems, whereby Indigenous people are not proportionally represented in positions of leadership and decision making, um, but was a particular uh, concern for us given the actual scope and, and emphasis of this project. Uh, without due representation, I was quite mindful that our review process and analysis uh, might not be appropriately, inclu appropriately inclusive of diverse Indigenous uh, perspectives and could create this implicit demand on Indigenous partners to feel like they had to speak on behalf of all Indigenous peoples or kind of represent a pan-Indigenous view uh, rather than speaking to their unique experiences. Another challenge was that of having to manage variable buy-in from our regional partners. As I said, this was across Canada, cross jurisdictional, and uh, you know they had representatives from different health ministries and agencies. And it's probably not surprising when I say that we are all feeling extreme capacity demands at the moment uh, with managing diverse health system crises and, and requirements. So this meant that not everyone necessarily saw this work as a top priority um, and, and as a top, you know, as a worthwhile demand on their time, just because of how much work they are managing and, and juggling at the current, uh, current moment. So it made it hard for people to look at this project and see how, you know, it, it was supportive of their unique jurisdictional considerations and needs. And finally, the last challenge here was that of bureaucracy. Uh, so every government of the day gets to set a mandate priorities and focuses for the health system policy and activities. And in the current climate, there are some significant differences in how things are prioritized when it comes to substance use system of care. I think some others have spoken to this. Um, uh, but one unique challenge uh, happened to be that while I was doing this work, we also had a number of election cycles. And uh, folks may or may not know that when an election cycle is called, uh, the civil service of that respective jurisdiction enters something called caretaker mode. Uh, so everything stands down and you're not able to, uh, you go down to essential services. So if you're relying on partners in that jurisdiction where there's an election, it can be really hard to get a response or decisions or kind of reviews done because you're not supposed to really do any cross jurisdictional or cross sectoral work. Uh, so how do we mitigate these challenges? Uh, so with respect to underrepresentation, our strategy was to center and emphasize indigenous voices outside of our governance structure. Uh, this included intentionally seeking out materials that had been prepared by Indigenous communities and leadership in the past on culturally safe and appropriate treatment services, as well as looking to integrate narrative and experiential evidence from partners wherever possible. Uh, further, we also structured the actual design. Oh, sorry. There we go. <laughs> uh, we structured the design of the knowledge product to hold space for future iterations wherein Indigenous people can include their stories and experiences directly into the materials. So it's not, uh, it's not a closed product. The intention is that it'll be an evergreen product that people can continue to iterate. Um, when it came to fostering the buy-in, our key strategy was being highly transparent in how this work was actually directly relevant to the work of our partners. And this included from the outset, establishing that core value proposition that reflected the unique jurisdictional and partner interests while staying true to that kind of core deliverable that was set out in the FPT working group agenda. We were also quite intentional in highlighting examples of wise practices from each region and linking these back into strategic priorities and goals that had been shared by our partners. By showing how the work was in fact responsive to the current policy and planning needs, people were more able to see the value in their participation and could see this as being a worthwhile use of their time even when they are so busy doing other things. Uh, and then finally, the biggest takeaway for me was, uh, and our mitigation strategy was that of building up an expectation and a culture of relational practice through our process. So we worked to ensure that from the top, we had the right partners and contacts in community, so that if things changed within the context of the government of the day, uh, for one of our partners, we were still able to have a connection point into that jurisdiction for information and input. Folks were also able to use our project plan and charter to determine if when they might need to delegate decision making and authority. Um, what's not said on this slide too is, uh, I think it's, but I think it's relevant is that this work did span eight months. So when there were kind of holdups due to election cycles, we were able to be nimble because we had that kind of scale of time. Uh, I do acknowledge that if I had been doing this in a shorter time period and there were that same kind of crush of elections, that might not have been possible to, to manage in the same way. 
Uh, so from where I am standing now, I'm ha very happy to report that we have completed the knowledge product and fulfilled our intended output and outcomes uh, in alignment with the commitments made through the uh, FPT work plan and our project charter. Uh, as noted previously, this product is still in prototype, but the design does allow for relational contribution and iteration. So hopefully it'll continue to have relevance and meet uh, future audience needs. Um, our work was also highly responsive to the needs of the group and of our partners. So our response has been quite positive. Um, and we were also, I think it's worth noting, the, the prototype we developed is uh, an, a virtual interactive tool. Uh, so it's not a standard briefing package, which I think we're so used to seeing in government policy. I can say that as someone who's been in government policy for longer than I care to think. Um, so it can it's more readily translated and adapted for future um, audiences. Uh, and then finally, of course, that, relation, that culture of relationship building and relational practice uh, means that while we've completed this stage of the work, uh, for future collaborative policy making, there are those relationships and, and connections that will uh, you know, foster future buy-in and engagement so that we can continue to do good work together. Uh, so uh, there are a number of lessons learned. I'm going to highlight just a few of them here. Uh, but at the end of over 500 hours of work and across those eight months, um, there were some key takeaways that I wanted to focus on as the enablers of our success. Um, oh, goodness, sorry, I keep doing this. Um, so having that clear value proposition from the start so that people could see how and why this was of interest. Uh, we emphasize that the way we do things is just as important as what we end up doing. Um, having those clearly defined roles and expectations so that folks knew what was being asked of them. Uh, building in flexibility and adaptation to help mitigate some of the challenges of doing collaborative work in sometimes very rigid bureaucracies. Uh, ensuring that our work stayed relevant and responsive to the emerging needs of our partners. Um, emphasizing that this work was a first but not a final step in the articulation of wise practices and learnings for how we build a system of treatment and recovery services that work for people in the ways that they need and define, and uh, moving outside of that traditional briefing package model to explore new tools for information sharing and translation. Uh, so that just brings me to the end, but in the spirit of relational practice and support that has been the focus of this work, I wanted to take a quick moment to express my sincere gratitude for the uh, public health and social policy faculty who have supported me throughout this practicum process, as well as my excellent supervisor Bethany at MMHA and the, uh, the great partners and collaborators I had uh, at Health Canada, MMHA and uh, ministries from across Canada, so many thanks.